Yeah, right, like. so my name is Delia Bellaby. I did have peanut butter for breakfast, but there's more to me than that. <laughs> um, I'm an architect and I'm based in Tiano, in Manipuri, so just west of here. Um, and this is Paul. Hello, I'm Paul. Um, I had coffee and yeah, <laughs> peanut, peanut butter as well actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then some cake, I think, after that from last, last night. Um, I'm a structural engineer and I uh, work in Queenstown, but on buildings across the country. Um, and yeah. we are. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're members of the Earth Building Association of New Zealand, EBANS, um, which is all about promoting the art and science of natural building materials. Um, we've also got our secretary here with her lovely baby, Tatiana, and Andrew Alcorn, who has done lots of research into natural materials and carbon footprints of natural materials, and he's going to be talking to you tomorrow. <laughs> so we've got quite a strong presence, really, for a small organisation. Um, but yeah, we're basically an organisation of architects, engineers, builders, self-builders, people interested in using these materials. So these techniques have been around for millennia. Um, they've been used across the world by humans for time immemorial, and they're all about using materials that are in your place and of your place. Um, so we've actually, I better do my little, little promo piece. <laughs> so we received a lot of funding through the UN University to promote uh, natural building techniques. What we're trying to do is make it slightly more accepted main, in the mainstream. So we're trying to create kind of demand plus also educate builders so that you've got when we've got demand we've got skilled designers skilled builders we've got councils that are prepared to consent building so we're trying to kind of inform people and get them enthused about these materials so with this funding we've been going around primary schools colleges universities um, councils building companies and just really you know within Otago and Southland are just really trying to promote things um, and it's been really successful and our aim is to hopefully get some built structures because, you know, buildings are a great way of learning. Um, so yeah, basically I won't talk to you guys about these things, but with primary school kids we're talking about materials, where materials come from, life cycle analysis, thinking about them. Also our health and safety briefing is any of these things you touch are perfectly fine for you. Um, we haven't brought any lime with us, which is a little bit less fine for you, but all of these things you can touch and you can put them on your garden when you're not using them anymore and there's no problem. It's not damaging at all. Um, so we have a lot of resources that we've kind of developed for kids, but the most important resources we've got are these three key elements here. So that is some sort of aggregate, sand, varying degrees of coarseness, depending on what you're doing, clays, um, and the clays vary as well, so you do have to kind of test and make sure you're using the right clays. And then some sort of binder, so straw um, is one that we use a lot, but there's also hemp, so hempcrete is another one. And then another one that we have here that we use for finer coats is actually a paper pulp. So this is from a paper mill, um, and that's for your sort of, when you're trying to do a less coarse finish. So with those three materials, we can do about eight or nine different things and what we're going to show you today is just how you can what you can do with those different things so the first mix i've got in my little mix mini mixing bucket here is one part sand one part clay and a quarter part water and it's kind of like a crumble topping and this here is ready when your crumble topping can kind of be squidged and squeezed to form a clump and that is your composite for a round earth building cool so Paul's going to talk to us a bit about how you make that into a wall. Awesome. Okay. Um, yeah, so I suppose, like I said, we're, we're, I'm a structural engineer. We, we design buildings. The, the, the aim of the game here is generally making buildings, making what, you know, what's, what's the walls made out of generally. You can also use these for floors and things like that. Um, not so much for roofs, but we do, we do a good line in domes as well um, sometimes. So... Um, yeah, round earth is. Do you want me to describe the the process for doing yeah. it? Yeah, let's do that. Yeah. Um, so I don't know if uh, does anyone come across natural building materials anywhere? Round earth, heard of it? Adobe, straw bales, hemp, that sort of thing, really. Um, so a bit of a, so round earth is like exactly like it sounds. It's where you take earth and you ram it together um, between usually between removable forms. So you end up with um, yeah. Two forms like that uh, you pour some soil into the middle of it um, of consistency like that and then um, put a put a mechanical or um, hand rammer. tamper yeah. rammer down there between it and that compacts it take the forms away you end up with a wall um, you, you, you can go go around the building uh, and build wall sections at a time or um, 
you get a beautiful... Yeah, it'll just go up. Um, and it, you end up with walls about 350, 400 thick, something like that. There are, there are some in central Otago. Um, there's, a few, there's a few new builds um, around here. Uh, and, I, and certainly I do a reasonable amount in Northland and uh, the north part of the North Island um, out, of, out of Rammed Earth. Um, and yeah, you just end up with a big monolithic wall. And sometimes, yeah, there's some pictures there. Um, you, you end up with nice horizontal bands. Like a sort of, so it looks like the it, strata it, of it the look, earth, you yeah. know. So, so it's something that architects get really excited about. Shit. It gets used uh, a lot. Basically. And there yeah. are some very beautiful kind of things that you get. So one of the things that I didn't mention before I launched into Rammed Earth <laughs> is that with um, all of these materials, you've got we've got different degrees of density so rammed earth is the heavy clay content density material and as you add fiber to it the more fiber you get the lighter it gets so straw bale being at the other end of the spectrum which is predominantly fiber with the clay on the outside so rammed earth is a beautiful sort of earthen looking structure and it performs really well from a thermal mass perspective so thermal mass being it gets heated up by the sun, it holds that heat, releases it when um, the space cools. Um, but from a thermal perspective, because it doesn't have lots of fiber in it, it's not really very insulating. Um, so, you know, your insulation in your wall is your woolly stuff, your stuff that's sort of got air pockets in it and fibers in it. So the fact that this is a really trendy building style, because it's beautiful, it's great, but it's not actually giving you a perfectly performing building. So that's something that is a bit of a challenge with the upgrade to the building code that's happening um, in terms of how do we make something that is an attractive, appealing way of using a nice natural product into something that's still giving you a high performance building that can be tested to show that it's meeting requirements. So um, a lot of them are gonna have insulation on the inside or the outside to be able to work. So. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, so I mean, it's got reinforcing as well. Yeah, it, I mean, I think it's. I mean, it's interesting. I, I, I've done a lot of work on historic, round earth buildings and historic earth buildings in general, and you find them all over the world. In, yeah, in different in different places. Uh, I would argue that New Zealand uh, is quite earthquakey generally, um, and uh, ge no, all that happens, an earthquake comes along, and it tr if that's your if that's your built your wall, it just tries to knock it over like that. And, um, and so you end up with one side trying to pull up and the other side trying to push down and so uh, into, the, into the ground. And so you're best off with a foundation that can provide a bit of weight to stop the whole thing tipping over and a bit of width to stop the whole thing sinking into the ground. And so generally speaking, around Earth's interesting from a natural building point of view because it's quite heavy, uh, basically. So you do need a decent width of foundation usually yeah. for, for that. Yeah. And so I think like all of these materials are going to be replacing, they can replace, you know, 80% of sort of more carbon heavy or environmentally impactful materials, but we're still going to use things like concrete in places for ring foundations. It doesn't have to be done that way. There, you can do things on piles, you know, there's people innovating ways of doing things with reduced concrete, but you know, there's, there's places where those materials make sense from a durability and a performance perspective. Um, so yeah, and rammed earth being heavy is gonna require, it requires reinforcing within the wall as well. Yeah. So that, you know, like just like a concrete wall would, so it's got some flexibility. Um, so yeah, there's, there's, there's pros and cons in terms of that. Um, so, I mean, rammed earth is beautiful um, and it is very trendy. Um, <laughs> like, any, like any earthen material though, um, you know, we have to think about protecting it. Over here, we did a very quick workshop during a, the Burning Horse Festival, which was amazing. And we just put on some, some cob onto some tires. There's no, there's only one layer of cob. There's no plaster, there's no lime plaster over the top of it. There's no roof and it's been rained on and it's kind of started to disrupt. I mean, it's actually held together reasonably well given how exposed it's been, but you know, your building left like that is obviously not ideal. So there's things we have to do to think about protecting those materials, just like with any house and Eve is a sensible thing. Um, but to turn this, the simplicity and versatility of these materials is, is one of the most exciting things about them. So all I need to do to make this into a different thing <laughs> from rammed earth to cob is to use one of your handy teacups. So I'm gonna pop, I'm just gonna read my recipe because I don't wanna get it wrong. A quarter <laughs> of water. Just like baking. And a handful, it is very <laughs> like baking, a handful of straw. <laughs> And I'm going to mix it up. It's 
too much for all that. And I'm just trying to make something that's going to be stickier and more binding. So you can see already it's gone from being something really, really dry into something that's more easy to shape. My straw strands are quite long. Um, but yeah, so, and I've probably put a bit too much water in there too. But so with this, rather than being a crumbly thing, I've got something that can be shaped into a wall or a curve or something quite readily. So cob. I, I think it just, it just tends, it's a bit like round earth. It's slightly less dense. Uh, when it comes together because it's got the straw in and generally you do, you're not needing formwork boards to compact the stuff between usually you can just sort of take it layer it on build it up layer it on again you know go again yeah uh, basically so once so, it when you finish it when you finish your course that you're doing you put you know you put some um, literally something to sort of key the next course onto and then one you know before that's you know the next day you come back and do your next lot so it's it's very labor intensive um, cob and a lot of historic buildings were built from cob because it was a very easy kind of mix readily available with what's around and um, and today we do things like pizza ovens or kind of curves and walls or things that are quite sculptural cob works really really well for um, it's got a little bit more over there. what was that the pizza ovens over yeah, there yeah 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 that's, yeah, that's that yeah. Sort of. so it's uh, and this is a cob mix so it's you know this got quite a thick straw strand in obviously for the scale of what I'm doing here um, but you know it's it's quite versatile but it's it suits itself more for a, straw, a small structure um, and you know I don't know if are there many new cob buildings that get built? There don't seem to be I think certainly uh, historically cob brilliant used across Europe quite a lot it's because labour's expensive in New Zealand relatively speaking and it's time consuming um, there don't seem to be too many new yeah. builds built here. It's just, uh, yeah, I think it's just a time thing. There was a guy on that was on Grand Designs in the UK like about four times with the same bloody house or different houses and it took him seven or eight years to build this massive house that was great and amazing and brilliant but anything that's going to take you seven or eight years to build is not, you know, it's a grand design, wonderful, but um, not, yeah, not yeah, necessarily, yeah. Um, yeah, perfect for yeah. everybody. Yeah, that, and that's, yeah. That, yeah. That's, but I think, again, that's interesting. You get a whole community, but because of a drying time and things like that, you end up doing a day and then a week later you do another day yeah. and then rather than a barn raising type, you know, type yeah. set where you just get everyone there for one day, boom, yeah. the whole thing's done. So. so this leads us beautifully on to our next <laughs> technique, which is Adobe. So this is a very rudimentary brick cast that we've done, but... You can see these forms here, which are just sort of mini versions. This is about a quarter size of a adobe brick that's normally made by a company called Solid Earth up in Nelson. So they are they make their own um, adobe bricks and build buildings with them. Um, and really, it's cob mix with um, a little bit more water, a little bit more straw, but it's getting something that's solid that can be put into the cast and formed into more of a brick. So it doesn't have the same kind of malleability. But what that means is that that, do you want to just hold up some of those pictures, Paul? Um, what it means is that you can make all your bricks and you can dry those and then you can bring them to site like and that. use them for construction, just like you would a standard brick. Yeah. So it's kind of getting the benefits of the cob material, but without the, the hassle of the labor and the time and the drying process. And the, um, so, you know, it's, and the, 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 the thermal performance of these is, is definitely better than rammed earth. Um, it is advisable though to still put some kind of coating to protect um, these bricks um, and we'll talk about the plaster systems a little bit later on once we talk about straw bale um, but again with these bricks the weight of them um, and the performance of them can be varied by adding more binder so the more straw you put in the lighter the bricks become but the better they become from a thermal perspective so light clay straw bricks are actually um, quite a versatile product and material yeah. um, and they actually perform really really well in earthquakes um, adobe walls because mm. you kind of use the principles of a masonry block that, yeah I mean I mean that's the, the deal I mean the everyone's seen regular house bricks uh, you know or blocks uh, made these are these are not fired at all or anything like that so there's no there's no heat um, uh, added to them particularly I suppose the, the one thing to say is 
you start off with a wetter mix uh, we've, we've been increasingly adding water that then dries out and what tends to happen is the things shrink so in a way adobe blocks a, a pre-shrunk uh, really they do all their shrinking you know on the uh, on the ground while you while you're drying them and then you put them into a house and so that works works yeah. quite well um, so you kind of know how they're going to perform in the wall right. because they're already a ready material it's pretty straight as opposed to this which is going to change you know as you're layering it up it, it tends not to i think it's it's um it definitely doesn't can i talk yeah, about this yeah, part? absolutely so yeah. um straw is actually the stalk of a grain plant okay so a barley a rye um a, a rice an oat um hay is a grass with sugar in it so it's got food so it rots okay so straw if you left it sitting in water yes would rot but it hasn't actually got its own sugars in it that's going to kind of cause it to rot unless it's wet mm. so the critical thing and i didn't bring a straw bale because i couldn't fit it in the back of my car um, but we kind of know what a straw bale looks like um, so straw bale is the thing that i'm the technique i'm passionate about and i think it's very sensible for this part of the country we all had a slightly nippy dewy night in a tent last <laughs> night um, and that's you know that's in march here so down in southland you know we need and generally the south island we need nice thick walls so a straw bale you're getting your module of your straw bale wall is effectively your brick um, but it is a hugely um, high thermal performance uh, module so a 140 mil wall which is a, a, the thicker than standard wall um, gets you like a, an R3 with your insulation inside, a straw bale would get you an R7, R6.8 to 7. So yeah, it's a thicker wall but it's giving you a massive amount of performance. It's also giving you a lot more acoustic performance. But with those straw bales we don't just stand them up and expect them to be a building, we have to encapsulate them in, in something. Um, and what we encapsulate them in is plaster. So that's at that end with a stick sticking out of it. <laughs> to bring this yeah, thank you. <laughs> So um, the plaster, again, is just clay with a little bit of binder. So this has got paper pulp in it and it's got water in it. So this is kind of your cake mix. This is your wet sort of cake mix. Um, and the coarseness of this and the coarseness of the binders, and there's a little bit of sand in it too, but that changes. You put three coats of plaster on the outside. So the clay goes on the straw and then it dries and you put another layer on and then we put lime over the top of that. So the reason that we don't put, a lot of people say, well, cement's really durable. Why don't you put cement on your, um, cement on your straw walls and that would like make it bulletproof. But clay's really incredible in terms of how it performs. So as we've seen just with the different mixes, it varies massively depending on the ratio of water that's mixed with it from something that's really quite dry and solid, something that's very kind of liquid and easily applied because clay is, what's called hygroscopic. So it, it's got molecules that absorb moisture really, really easily. So if you've got a clay, even a dry brick in your building or a clay floor or a clay plaster, when there's moisture in the air, that clay absorbs that moisture and locks it away so that you don't have mold and damp and condensation and coldness in your room. And when your um, air dries out, it releases that moisture. So it's kind of doing a natural humidification of your space. Um, and so that's also got structural benefits as well, doesn't it? That quality. It, it, I think what, you, you, what you've got is you've got a, um, a, a, a binder that hold, that's holding everything together. Obviously, you don't want things to get too, um, too wet. So we're, we're protecting it because you've seen, you've seen sandcastles. Uh, they work very well with uh, a small amount of water in. Uh, if you put loads and loads of water in a sandcastle, you know, it will, it will go. Um, so we're, we're looking to protect the buildings from uh, water. But the, the, the ways to do that are, you know, with, are with eaves and with veneers. Uh, really, yeah. like, as, with, you know, as with timber, every, every, every building material really, you know, need, does need protection from the weather really. So yeah, I think but so with the, with the encapsulation with the clay, what that means is that hygroscopic movement um, allows, it holds the moisture in, but it also allows moisture to move through the wall. So you might have heard people talking about building breathability. And what breathability really means is vapour permeability. So that's the ability for water to get from one side of a surface to another side of it. So it's just how it moves through. So if you were to go, right, here's my lovely clay wall or straw bale wall, and I'm going to put some cement plaster on the outside so the rain doesn't damage it, that works great from the outside. But from the inside, when your moisture from inside is coming through, it gets trapped in the wall and it rots your wall. 
Whereas if you put the clay plasters on, the moisture moves right through, so your straw in the middle is protected. So it's kind of, it's, they're really, really simple materials, but they've actually performed, because they're natural materials, and nature is, by nature, very complex <laughs> as a system. These natural materials work together as a complex system to do some really complex science, but it actually gives us a really beautiful habitat to, to live in. So these materials create really interesting, lovely, livable spaces and healthy spaces. Um, you know, these deteriorate in a hundred years time if nobody's maintained it. It's not going to damage anything if it goes into the ground. And on a building site, all of those materials, you know, you put the straw in your garden, you put the clay under a tree, nothing really happens, you know. So buildings are responsible for between 40 and 80 percent of waste in landfill um, around the world. And we're building like the equivalent of a city of Paris every few months on the world in the world. So we're a massively high um, you know, impact industry. Um, a lot of green buildings have got really high-tech technologies incorporated in them, which require a lot of manufacturing um, and also a lot of shipping around the place. So, you know, trying to use materials that are locally sourced that are actually still working in a really high-tech way, we can achieve some interesting things. Um, a lot of the buildings that we're familiar with, with natural building materials, are small-scale, historic sort of cottages, but there's a lot of work going on with larger scale buildings and unfortunately Ben who's a builder of straw bale up in Wanaka who was supposed to be here today couldn't come for various reasons and he is actually developing a pre-built straw panel which we've got some photos of. I think, um, yeah, yeah. I think we do yeah I mean that's... we were going to have a big panel here sorry but I'll see if I can find that one there. Yeah. Um, just covered in stuff. Yeah I mean it's from my, certainly from my point of view it's it's interesting um, I would like to uh, get these building techniques used by more people generally um, and one way to do that is to make it easier um, to do so I can yeah, yeah, find you, I'll find it. Um, and yeah it, it's like this with a lot of construction like Delia was saying construction waste is a big issue and um, yeah use it using construction materials where you don't necessarily need to use them is um, yeah is what we're trying to trying to reduce basically it's all about using less stuff yeah. while you know people still need places to live and go to school and hospitals and things like that so we, there is a requirement for building uh, generally but yeah so what we're doing with ben um, in wanaka and how we're at the moment we've got a um, a panelized system it's 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 about one one meter wide and about 2.2.4 2.6 high um with a press build the panels uh put them all on the back of there we go Let's well see. i'm just gonna sorry oh, these are all clipped that. together but <laughs> for, we might just talk about so with straw bale um the yeah. straw bale isn't actually the structure of the building um well, it, it is can well, it, it can, can be, be. Yeah, it can it definitely can yeah. be and, it, and it's it's hard to get through council in new zealand as the structure of the building so um the durability requirement for a structure is 50 years to, to demonstrate that what's a structural element is going to last that long. And with clay plasters and things on the building, um, council don't accept. It's difficult to prove that that's possible. In America, there's a few, quite a few that are built as load bearing. So generally within New Zealand, to get these buildings happening, we use the straw as sort of infill in between uh, an structure. Yeah, and it's, so it's effectively your insulation and your kind well it's kind of your wall yeah framing and I, I think i think the issue we've got is it's, it's as you can see uh, maybe on some of the photographs and just looking at that straw let's do it you know it's it is a it's if you if you if you're containing it and squashing it it does it does have a certain strength and it's you know it's really from an earthquake point of view it's lightweight it's insulative it's got a bit of flexibility in there which is which is brilliant um it's just it's quite hard to uh, guarantee and prove that without a series of testing and we haven't done the testing uh, on these you know on, on straw bale panels like this very much in New Zealand um, really yeah. so um, yeah but so one way we got around that essentially is by having a timber frame uh, which is a more conventional way of building uh, yeah. and then and then putting the, the straw you know straw bales uh, within that so the so the up, so yeah. the, the the timber structure would be at wider centers than within a normal yeah, timber frame yeah. wall otherwise we're using not a lot of points um, yeah. but you know it might be what two meter centers or something yeah. or where you've got a window opening or something yeah. like that so you know you can see this is a more of a timber frame and then the straw is getting stacked up and kind of hammered inside. I mean, these are all here for everyone to look at later. I know it's hard to see from a distance. Um, but what um, Ben in, in uh, Wanaka is trying to do is kind of 
because he's a builder and he recognises that it's difficult for people to visualise as builders and understand um, you know, how you can do something with straw. So he's doing a, um, a kind of pre-built system. So all these panels get manufactured um, in a workshop and then they get kind of brought to site and hyabbed into position. Um, so it kind of means that, that that work happens outside in a way and then it comes on site and in two days you've got all your walls up. Um, and these have already got um, a base coat of plaster on as well. So they've got some protection. Um, so it's kind of quite an instantaneous way of getting a building. And bu builders can kind of understand precast stuff as well and kit set stuff. So it's kind of, every time I show this to builders, they go, oh, whereas when I show them, you know, us hedge trimming a wall or hammering it in with a mallet, they're a bit like, oh. So I think this is a really good way of kind of trying to bridge a gap. And that's one thing that we're really passionate about is just, there's a lot of potential in these materials um, and there's a lot of cost benefit and health and performance benefit for people using the buildings. Um, but while they're something that's kind of a little bit quirky or a little bit misunderstood, it's difficult to get them used more in the mainstream. Um, so I'm tending to do, you know, the majority of my buildings are not natural buildings. Um, I'm trying to move that way with my practice, but I'm certainly encouraging people to incorporate some of these materials and products in their buildings. So earth floors um, are another thing that you can do. Um, so there are ways of doing earth floors um, which avoid concrete altogether apart from around the edge. I mean, an earth floor is effectively a topping like this, which is applied in thin layers and kind of hammered down, you know, sort of compressed down, um, almost like a plaster. I mean, I've asked, it is effectively a plaster, but it's a coarser mix. I've tried to, um, get people that do earth floors to see if it can be done with like a standard kind of concrete kind of tool. Um, but they kind of need adaptation to work. At the moment you get people kind of going around with floats and trowels, so it's quite a labour intensive thing. Um, but the benefit of it is if you've got, the, you've got some um, thermal mass in your space and you've also got some hygroscopic stuff going on and you've got um, it's a much nicer surface to stand on than a concrete slab. Like anyone who's been in a house with a concrete slab, like sta even standing at the kitchen island, you sort of start to feel quite drained by the end of it. And it's, you know, if, unless it's heated, it's not a comfortable floor or space to be in. So, so I've got a couple of kind of clients incorporating that. And I've also got clients who are having a couple of walls with natural plasters on, so they're getting that benefit. So um, I think it's important to sort of start easing those materials into mainstream industry so that people see the benefit because I recognize that everyone's going to go let's have a straw bale house and let's have a cob house and you know and the while the, like you were saying before about there's a third of people that are going to be already sold and then there's a third that you're never going to reach and it's kind of like well how do you sort of just try and get a little bit of interest out there like we're all here we're all on the same page we're just learning from each other but if you're trying to transform people's mindsets you've got to kind of do that incrementally to make it something they can understand. So that's why I think that what Ben's doing is makes a lot of sense mm. because it's making it... Um, What's the problem that you... Um, I'm looking at a single-based lifestyle block oh. and the council's saying there's one or two hundred year flood zone. I've yep. got to get the building onto a bit that says it hasn't got it. But yep. I don't trust that maybe somewhere down the track we might get six inches or Absolutely. reasonably yeah. Yeah. So it won't be high speed water. Yeah. Um, what's this, what sort of risk have we got uh, doing this type of construction? Um, I mean, so obviously those things have to be considered and designed out. So there's two questions. The foundation question is obviously for any building, if you're building in a flood zone, you need to be thinking about the foundation type that you're using and the level that your house is at. I mean, we've, we've had a lot of uh, learnings from that in the North Island in the last, um, you know, this year. Um, and so that's something that has to be figured out regardless. These buildings can be done on pile structures, mm. so they can be done up out of the ground. Um, there are some things called the Earth Building Standards of New Zealand, which we should be promoting really, really heavily because eBands has developed those. It was the first, New Zealand was the first country in the world to develop recognised standards in earth building techniques and it's world leading and it's been copied around the world. And we've recently, um, in 2020, they were updated after to get them to current best practice. So we've actually got a set of documents that kind of show you how to use these building techniques in a way that is durable and works and um, is suitable for the New Zealand environment. Um, so, you know, we can certainly help direct you to those things. But within those standards, there are a series of tests um, for the clays. 
um, to make sure that you're using the right type of clay. Um, and also they've got what's called a risk matrix. So any building that you do in New Zealand, you have to do a test to, to determine the suitability of the cladding that you're using. So you can't just go and put, uh, you know, like a, a timber weatherboard on a wall with no eave over the top that's exposed to massive southerly wind-driven rain. Because, you know, we know that within 10 years that cladding's not going to work anymore and it's not going to meet the building code. So we have to do that with conventional materials. And the New Zealand um, earth building standards have developed a similar matrix so you can go through and see what's suitable for an earth building. So what it means, so I've got a straw bale house that I'm designed and it's in for council at the moment that it's hopefully going to be built in Tiana over the summer and we've basically the eaves end up being about there are about 400 mil deeper than they would have been for a different type of wall if you're wanting to do a really contemporary building with parapets and no eaves well you know natural materials probably aren't the go for you um, because you know you're going to be exposing them to far too much weathering um, you know and they are the fact that they're good materials that are going to erode away into the ground means that they do need to be protected to be fully durable, but they are completely valid building materials that can be durable, they just need to be maintained as does any building material and put in the right way, as does any building material. Um, uh, can you talk about the testing your clay part of it? Yeah, sure. So um, the key part is, is that um, we've got, there's different components and various different um, sizes would you want to no I go for it yeah, so um it's just you, you what you need to do is figure out the scale of the grain that you've got and the key thing as well is to make sure you've not got silt so a lot of especially down in southland here we have a lot of things that we think of as clay but it's actually very fine particles and silt and it's not actually a sticky true content um, so that's important and shrinkage and expansion are really important as well so there's a series of tests whereby you make make your sample up and you make some disc samples of the same size and you see how they contract um, and then there's also this the test which is the cigar test and that's about how long can you roll your clay for before it starts to kind of come off the end and break and that so the length that you can get it to shows that you've got the right thing going on so this is actually because this is a sand clay mix has come back as a sandy clay so because it dropped off at less than five centimetres, the sand in this, which I know there is because I put a cup of sand in there, but if I got that from the ground, so this clay here would be, would be able to do that elasticity for way longer. Um, it's probably also got a bit of aggregate in it, this one, but... You know, so it's got much more ability, oh, maybe another no, three centimetres from that <laughs> one there. But, but yeah, so there's some testing like that. But the, yeah, the, the issue is, is that these standards are very much for you to be able to demonstrate that you can find clay locally and sort of prove that it works. This is the thing that terrifies councils the most, is that there's that self-test sort of aspect to it. Yeah. Um, and so that's something that we're quite keen on trying to push so that you, people are doing it right and using the right materials. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think from my point of view, it's a sort of a, you either do a performance-based standard, which is just like, whatever you do, it's just got to be this strong or have this resistance to water or something like that. And, you know, go for your life and find, find something uh, that will achieve that, you know, clay-wise. Clay and then with, there's a series of tests that tell you how to how to achieve that really so you can yeah you can do it really yeah um, oh yeah i mean it's, but, it's totally doable but, as long oh, as you're referring back to the standards it works but yeah. so for example i'm doing two straw bale houses in canterbury and we've actually got canterbury clay bricks i got a mixing you know a big truck of the clay and the sand mix which will arrive as kind of the dry crumbly mix that i showed you at the start and can be stored on site and it will just be hydrated to different degrees and mixed to different degrees to be used for the various processes. So because these houses are within, you know, 40 minutes of Canterbury clay and it just, there's a scale in what comes and the mix is kind of guaranteed because they already know that it performs for bricks. It kind of makes sense to do it that way. But obviously it wouldn't be hugely environmentally sensible for us to be sort of shipping it all over the country that way. It kind of defeats the purpose of using a local resource. So what, what, what I would really like to see is, you know, every region has got a contracting companies and a 
a, um, a lime works or a cement company, a concrete company. So why can't we sort of have those guys who are getting clay out and digging out of the ground because it's getting in the way of their gravels or whatever, or it's on a farm and it's, you know, they, they want to shape the land differently. We can use that material. We could be kind of mixing it and using it in a more localised way, but on a slightly more industrial scale. Because I think that's where um, these materials kind of fall over is people want to use them, but you've got to have, it's the high labour content um, and there's a high kind of degree of having to have some knowledge to, to figure them out and it's harder to do in a mainstream way. That's right. um, which, you know, I think, I think it's great to have a self-build aspect to it and probably most people here would be interested in that side of it. But I think if you're really going to change that 40 to 80 percent of landfill and actually the crap building quality that we've got, even with that, with the cost and the landfill that we've got, then we've got to do something that's kind of making it a bit more mainstream and a bit more approachable and viable and accepted, you know. So... We're really interested in about getting some research funding to kind of actually prove some of the things. So at the moment, for bracing for straw bale, we use very standard yeah. strap braces. Mm. Yeah, that you buy, you know, from any builder's merchant, uh, really, you know. It, and it, and it's, a, it's a standard building technique and it works and carpenters know it, you know, the, 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 nor the normal industry here can, can use it, uh, yes, basically. But if we can go to brands test a load of things then yeah uh, i mean we're, we we're can, kind of we hopeful that the plaster them. itself mm, absolutely. you know because yeah. you're applying so that's what you normally have is your metal strap brace going between the timber structures but if you if you plaster which yeah. is binding all those fibers together works yeah, yeah. but that would just require to be tested to that's prove right, that it can do right. it you know so, so yeah. we're kind of in a um i feel like we're in a um sort of at a tipping point at the moment whereby people are recognizing things have to change and stuff has to happen. Um, but in order for industry to invest in things that are needed to make things be at a bigger scale, there's got to be a market demand. And if it's something that's only on a small scale, how do you, you know, how do you tip that point? So um, working with the students um, is really, really good and, and school because it means they're getting an awareness and you're getting a skill base and you're getting a future kind of knowledge. Um, talking to people to, so that people can say I want to be using that material you know who do I go to having a network so that people are aware more building consents with these materials just help to prove that it's something that people want um, so yeah I mean we're all about trying to promote it as best we can and the best way to do that is to have buildings and show people buildings um, so we've got a project um, we've been working with Enviro schools um, and doing some little workshops like this with kids and we've got a, um, a building hopefully going to happen at Fiordland College which is going to be a straw bale building with an earthen floor completely off grid and that's going to be like a sustainable classroom but the kids are involved they're doing some carbon modeling just on the where the materials are coming from we're also going to have them involved in the building of the building and then they're going to experience the building so and we're hopefully going to be able to monitor the building and how it's performing you know in terms of not needing air conditioning systems and those kind of things. So those are things, you know, buildings are, are, are things that we can use. So it'd be great to actually have some that we can um, use, you know, to teach people. But yeah, come to an EBANS conference if you're interested, <laughs> because we go and look at lots of buildings at those. Here. If you were just starting out, you sort of just testing the waters and wanted to have a crack yourself and just do a wee cabin or something like that, yeah. um, what would what system would you recommend having a go at on, on a sort of a scale of maybe price? difficulty in time um i mean i i would and so, so yeah i mean i, I would say straw bale is the simplest thing straw bale yeah like, round earth and, and adobe yeah. yeah and cobs so, i mean yeah. adobe you've got to make all your bricks down here like you could buy them from nelson and get them bought down yeah. um but yeah the, the point of it is to kind of probably be doing your local source yeah. i mean we have lots and lots of straw um so the straw for my place actually came from uh, just around mossburn um, and so, you know, and, the, and my clay comes from a farm 15 minutes down the road, you know, so 80% of the building material in my walls is coming from, you know, a 10k, you know, 15k radius, which is pretty awesome. So that would be the easiest? That would be the easiest. Yeah. So, and it's timber frame, so it's kind of a standard, something that you can kind of see and understand a little bit more and buy your framing and then the straw goes in between. Um, and it's going to give you a really good thermal performance as well. And like the, the, the sort of barn raising idea of having mm. a few people there, like to stack up your straw bales, even on a sort of 150 square meter house, is probably only two days. So it's, it's the plastering and the time of the plastering that's more expensive, uh, more time expensive. But 
You can put cladding over straw. So where you've got really exposed faces, so on my south wall, you know, I've got, you know, big sort of southerly events that come in the winter. So I've got metal cladding on that wall. So there's just a cavity batten over the face of the straw and there's a metal cladding on that because I don't want to be replacing that, you know, repairing that plaster every three years, you know. But the rest of the house, which is sheltered and under eaves, you know, that plaster will be there and I'll only have to check it, you know, for cracks if there's been a major storm event or an earthquake or something and just general repairs like I would any other type of cladding, and you know. If there were cracks and pieces, would you have more of an issue with rats and mice? No, 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 no. So because there's no food in this, yeah. like vermin doesn't eat this. So mm. it's, it rots because of water if it's not encapsulated, but no, no, you don't. And the other thing we haven't talked about is fire. So loose straw there is highly flammable. Um, but straw in a bale is kind of bound together and compressed. So all those strands are going in different directions. So fire can't actually pass through. So a straw bale has got, has met testing for 30 minutes fire rating, which is the same as a timber wall with fire line jib on both sides. Um, a straw bale wheel encapsulated in plaster has, has achieved a 90 minute fire rating. Oh, yeah, so, um, you know, that's, yeah. that's better than concrete. It's the same as concrete. Yeah. So it, it works really, really well. And it's so fire, yeah, some, yeah there's some of, there. our, some of our fire test um, stuff that I'm not sure where that one's from. Yeah, um, so it's, um, yes. I've got a bit of a silly question, but um, how do you wire it all up? Do you, how do you wire it up? Yeah, like when you need to put your electrical wire in. So <coughs> you're like in a normal, in a normal, um, so for straw bale, mm. you still have a timber bottom plate that those um, timber bucks sit on. And so some people run their wiring in front of that and then just have a skirting board. Mm -hmm. um, at our place, we're going, we've just got internal walls and we've got our services in those internal walls. So, you know, we're just, it's just sort of sensible design, thinking about those things. Um, but yeah, in, in Adobe, you can have conduits yeah, kind of them. running through or chasing. Um, but again, it's like, it's just thinking about it. Same as you would with the concrete building. You've got to think about the sense, mm. but that's a good question. If you um, had a threaded rods mm. and then at the top have a board and yeah. screw that clamp down, does that strip make it structurally stand or you still need this frame that you're talking about? So, yeah, to be honest, there's a couple of different ways of doing it. Um, I've seen the yeah, the, the threaded rod and, the, and then, and then as, as a tie down Tension system. It, yeah. I think what you've, what, to go a bit more, a bit structural, um, you've got to match the tension that you can get out of the rod with the compression that you can get out of the straw, basically, and, and, and match, those, match those two things. Um, and yeah, I think sometimes you can, sometimes. It depends, for instance, if you've got a floor going, a first floor going onto it, which gives you a, a extra weight, or if you've just got a roof on it and so it's a it's a calculation thing basically but yeah those those threaded nut because again there are there are systems now that um for multi-story timber structures that are perfect for straw bale it's like a a one-way threaded nut thing that'll that'll take up um any compression that you get uh but also um but won't won't give it back sort of thing so you know really clever little innovative mechanisms sort of thing that i you know really want to put into these straw buildings because i feel that's that's the it's that marrying of the technology with the natural mm. building materials is yeah it's probably the way to go yeah sort of thing, and i think it? that's where um a, that's what's great about you know a lot of people in the community in these um interested in these materials is we've all kind of got experience in other aspects of construction and you can kind of see those things that you could apply but again, it's um, it's kind of done on a slightly R and D basis with projects as they come along, at the, as the way as it goes now. Um, and it has all got to be done to a degree that we're all comfortable with. Like we were just talking about a two-story straw bale building that we're working on that's on piles on a sort of semi-condemned site in Christchurch. You know, <laughs> I think it's given Paul a few more sleepless nights than it has me. But you know, yeah. but you know, but, there's... I mean, I think, uh, but it's quite a good example that I am. Um, happy basically doing a two-story straw bale house on the port hills on piles you know in Christchurch in an earthquake zone it, you know this it's if we can do that then shit we can do pretty anything. much anything uh, really so yeah, that, yeah that works. Um, and in Italy there are um, there was at the international straw bale conference which was in Methven in 2016 um, that was kind of I think Tatiana and I both met there didn't we and just got excited about earth building at that point and um, there was a really amazing Italian architect there who was building multi-story townhouses and the walls were straw the floors were straw the roof was yeah. straw you know there was a concrete slab at the bottom but everything else was straw you know it was amazing yeah. and it was just pre-compressed 
Um, I think, I mean, I think the key to it is having the right people involved. Um, so, you know, I think for some people they find it very difficult because they're not following the standards, they haven't got the knowledge. If you, can dem if you get the right designers involved, the right team of people, then no, it shouldn't be that way. And one mm. of the reasons for these workshops with councils and things as well is to kind of say to them, you know, look, look, this is a compliance pathway using the standards, you know, and I think the councils all said to us, so we've talked to Queenstown Lakes, Otago, Southland, Invercargill, they all said we actually think there's a lot of potential in this, how do you make it easy for us to consent them, what can you, you know, these are the things that scare us, how do you address these things, you know, and EBANS is all about kind of helping people with that, so, you know, we've got some little booklets here, happy to give you information, you know, we, we will... Mm. We can connect you to people in your region that can can help you to make those things work yeah. better. And, I, and I'd even say the other way around, really. That I know Thames. Uh, I did a house there, and the whole bloody building department came to have a look round. You know, people yeah. are interested in it, and yeah. and I think see, not not even the potential, but see, it's totally possible and relatively straightforward with um, questions that. Uh, people ask and then it's like what about fire as I like, look here's our fire test certificate you know we've, 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 we're, we're able to answer all of the questions I suppose is yeah. the bottom line and yeah. council sh councils should be asking those questions yeah. and we should be answering them it's not it's not a fight really yeah basically. it shouldn't be um, and I think really. I think if it's um, I think where people councils have been nervous about it is when things have happened and haven't been done right like a lot of a lot of issues have come from buildings being repaired using cement plasters for example you know even a cob building can be damaged by cement plasters because the water can sort of sit against the earth and the you know and it, and, it, and it affects it and it affects the structural integrity of it so things being done incorrectly has made councils nervous so you know you need to go to the right people with the right knowledge to and you know and we want to make the more people out there with the right knowledge so it's easier for people because lots of people have said to, to me you know I wish I could have built this but I couldn't find the right person you know so yeah. What about painting your walls? Yes, yeah, so you can use, as long as you use a silicate paint or a, or a, a casein paint, something that's still vapour permeable, um, so you don't want to use something that's going to stop that moisture movement through, yes, you can still do that. So lime plaster we haven't really talked about too much, but I'll just answer your question first yeah, time. Yeah, there is another one. Um, I went to a workshop once which was light earth, yeah. Yeah. which is uh, between two... Yes, uh, that's right. How does that stack up compared to all the other? Oh, look, I, to be honest with you, I was going to show you that, but I sort of... Um, <laughs> so light earth uses a very runny clay, um, mm. so I would need to... It's, it's like this but wetter, so it almost just coats your fingers with no stickiness and you literally just mix that in with some earth and some, some straw and just to make it slightly sticky. Uh, it's, it's not as insulating as a straw bale but it is a really good infill. Um, all of those um, fairy tale houses over in Europe, you know, with the um, timber and the white infill is all built from straw clay like that. Um, and they've lasted for hundreds of years, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, yeah, it's with cow dung, yeah. So yeah, yeah, it's infill in between timber frames, yeah. yeah. But it's giving you insulation, and again, it's got a plaster on it that's protecting it and coating it. Mm -hmm. So the key component of the exterior skin of the plaster is lime. Um, and so lime is incredible because effectively, I'll just find my little thing to show you the, the demonstrator. <laughs> so um, it actually, t it comes from the ground, it's heated, made into powder form, and then it can be hydrated again, made into your paste that becomes your plaster, and then it actually sets again to become limestone. So effectively you end up with sort of a one and a half to two mil coating of limestone on the outside of your building, which is, you know, very water resistant, but still vapor permeable, so things can mm -hmm. still come out. So the houses that I'm doing in Southland, I'm still putting a paint over the top of that lime, a silicate paint, just for that extra layer of protection, um, just because I don't want to be maintaining the plaster all the time. Um, and also lime comes out quite white, and sometimes you like to have something that isn't white. Yeah. Um, but yeah, on the inside of the building, just leave the clay if you want to see the clay, or you can mm -hmm. put lime or you can paint it.
What about in a bathroom area? Yeah, so lime in a bathroom, if you've got natural clay plasters there, mm. definitely. But we'd still, I wouldn't, I would never, you know, no one would recommend doing it sort of as you splash back around your bath or anything like that, you know, just like you wouldn't have just exposed jib board there. You'd mm. still do a tile or something. Mm. Um, and so you just kind of think about, I, and I always try and keep plumbing fittings away from the straw bale walls so that you're just you're reducing the risk of a burst pipe or something that might cause an issue there. So it's just kind of thinking logically about those things. And it's really just to reduce the hassle that you might have with your building in the future, you know? Mm. Yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry, I've missed it, but um, you talk, touched a little bit on insulation. Yeah. I just wondered what your thoughts were on using wool. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, no, wool's fabulous. And um, mm. so try to use wool as, you know, within roof spaces and things. Um, so we're not using straw within roof spaces at this stage. Um, but yeah, that would be the, the yeah. that, that would be what we would use. Absolutely. I don't know why it's not done more. Yeah. Is the, is, is the honest answer. Like a mm, yeah. Yeah. And, yeah, and, and moisture as well. Yeah. It handles moisture really well. Yeah, it's it's and it's available. Um, yeah. The, I mean, there previously have been um, issues with it settling within a, within a wall cavity, basically. So you need to support it or mix it with something. Yeah, or, most of know. it has a slight bit of polyester fibre through it. So, yeah, the, the commercial stuff like that you're that. buying, but I mean, it's it's on a small degree and it's making it work so it kind of makes sense but mm. you know um there's, there's some a farmer just down the road from me who actually supplies terralana you know with his uh, who's the the you know the big big wool insulation company but he didn't use wool in his own house because it was too expensive <laughs> <laughs> and i said there's, well that's a, a bit daft yes. so you know it's, it's kind of also that um challenging people's ideas about things as well and, and educating them. And the more demand there is for that material to be readily available, the cheaper it's going to get as well. But you're fighting quite big corporate companies that have got products mm. that they promote and that are readily available and cheap, you know? Um, for, for pink bats? Pink bats, you know, yeah. I think that, In comparison. That, as, as a swap yeah. out, really, yeah. is it? There was one question over the... Could wool fibre be part of replacing uh, straw, for example? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm not sure. It's not something I've ever. I mean, I know I've certainly. It's very hard to make sense. Yeah. yeah. It's too it wiry. It's possible, but it's very hard to make sense. Oh sun. yeah, yeah. Chris, hello, Chris. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, with, with with the lime, it's you've got to check those natural fibres that they actually don't break down with the burning of the lime. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. Yeah, yeah. Chris is an amazing plaster expert based in Lochiel, um, and if you're going to do an earth floor. For me later this year, aren't you? So yeah, Chris knows a lot. You've played around with mixing mussel shells and all sorts of things into plastic. I made lime out of um, uh, oyster shells. There's a, an abundance of oyster shells in Southland, and uh, no one knows what to do with them. And uh, at one stage, even driveway in Otaparo was out of oyster shells because <laughs> the only way they could get rid of them was the closest way. And now they're actually in demand because the guys make a natural fertilizer and soil conditioners oh. used to bring big beetle trucks with mussel shells from Marlborough down. And and then they saw this potential of um, using the shells here, but I made lime by burning them with wood slash. Oh, okay. And the, the beauty of um, lime is um, even if you do burn uh, wood, it is actually carbon neutral. Uh, it's not like cement, oh. which doesn't absorb CO2. Lime absorbs CO2 and it becomes a carbon neutral product. Yeah, well, I mean, that's that's the other thing. So it's not just um, the fact that you're using something that's natural from the ground. And the reason I think that straw and building with straw is has a real strong resonance with agriculture is that stalks of straw, I think um, there's, a, there's a building inspector in Canterbury who's in Ebans, and he reckons there's enough straw stalk burnt in Canterbury alone to build 40,000 houses a year. <laughs> and that's releasing oh, well, all that carbon yeah, that that plant it. has taken in, right? So I would love to see it that farmers could get carbon credit for selling straw to be sequestered in buildings, yeah. you know? And then we'd be building buildings that are actually zero or negative yeah. carbon buildings, you know, as opposed to really high carbon buildings. Do you have to bale the straw with wire? No, well, flax twine is so the high, that's an interesting comment. The highest carbon component of a straw bale is polyester twine. <laughs> so if you can use, um, yeah, the baler that I'm, I've been using has got a, you can be using a flax twine. Mm -hmm. So 
that's not an issue for us. And we've got a flat filling in South. Exactly, oh, yeah. exactly. Like to me, I think there's so much industrial potential and connection mm. for these things. Um, and it, you know, so it's actually something that could be generating jobs as well as doing things better. You know, mm. you had a question. Yeah, it's, um, I'd love to hear about the whether or not people are just framing up houses normally and then and filling with natural. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, so I mean, like the light straw clay that he was asking about definitely can work that way. Um, and certainly for internal walls, it's really good acoustically and, you know, so it, it can work really, really well. Um, and you could do it on your external walls, but you'd need to be using your plasters. But certainly for renovation projects, it's definitely a way of doing it. And um, the other thing is these smaller versions of these bricks as kind of a veneer. So you can put those on an internal wall and you're getting the thermal mass and you're getting um, the, the, the moisture control, but you're just renovating one wall in your house, you know? Mm. So that's something I'm really passionate about is that kind of bridge over just to get these materials in normal buildings with people. Mm. So, Cause once people start to see the materials and experiencing them, then they get kind of sold. Um, so that I think that's a really critical way of getting it happening. But it is interesting that there isn't a product, which is a straw pink that. Yeah, essentially, yeah. isn't there? And, and yeah. I feel like, yeah, with a bit of flax twine and a, and a, a shaped baling machine, you could produce a 600 wide, 140 deep, you know, something like that, yeah. as a pa as a swap out for pink bats. And, yeah. and that's the sort of, you know. Yeah, it's a stable panel. Exactly, yeah. easy way to Yeah, market, and because and there's, there's so really. much potential in all of this. You know, we were just even talking about, you know, all those issues, the forestry, um, you know, all the stuff that's coming from the, the trunks and the, I can't remember what the term for it is, but the stuff that's been washed the out slash. to be slashed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, we could be making, chipping that and making wood fibre insulation, which mm. is really high performing and uses a waste product, you know, and again, mm. it's carbon sequestering, you know. So mm. people say it's too expensive to take the slash away and deal with it. But if you actually had a product, it's not expensive. You're making money from it, you know. The cost avoidance. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But then it's trying to... Site. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's yeah. part you bring it along with your forestry crew, and that's what you do, you know. Mm. Um, because at the moment, um, you know, to achieve passive house more easily, especially with the um, pre-made panels, we're putting wood fibre board on the outside just to get that because it's any thermal bridging with the timbers. Because obviously your seven seven is only where the straw is. As soon as you've got timber there, it's reducing the R value. Mm. So you put insulation right over the face and wood chipboard's brilliant for that. But we have to import that from, you know, Europe or China, which is kind of we, we nonsensical, well, you know. And we don't have a we don't currently have a New Zealand wood chipboard making machine. Yeah, which you is know, nuts. It's yeah. that sort of thing that oh, could have some investment. Yeah. Um, just going back to the wall again, the outside um, plaster um, that you described, could any of the fine fibres at all be sort of chopped? Well, horsehair was used quite a lot yeah. in plasters. Yeah, so I mean, there's no reason why. I, I don't know if wool would be too curly and coarse, maybe, but yeah, certainly like horsehair has definitely been used within plaster as binders. Um, so the paper pulp idea comes from Hawke's Bay. There's a really good straw bale builder in the chair of Eban's, Pat Mawson. So he's right next to a paper mill. And so the paper pulp is really, really fine. Um, and when it's wet, it kind of makes the plaster really silky. You see how silky, and the, so for your final coats, it just gives you a beautiful, smooth surface. Um, whereas obviously straw is going to be a coarser kind of look. But yeah, I mean, I think experiment a little bit with what's locally available to you, which is what Pat's done to kind of come up with this, you know? So I mean, there's, there's lots of option for that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, uh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah well, I mean, I think as well with them, um, because with the flax, you've obviously got the coarser stuff outside, but then you've got the softer stuff inside, which definitely, because I have actually, um, from the mill down near Riverton, somebody gave me like a quite, it's almost like spider web. It's like really fine fibers that come as part of their waste product. And I was like, this would be amazing in a plaster. You know, so I think, because plants and nature is so versatile, you can, we could probably use various different parts of, especially Harakiki, yeah. I mean, I'd be very interested in getting that Riverton factory involved and doing some stuff. Yeah. I was just wondering about the structural quality of your products in outdoors without protection of a roof over it. And like, how can we, I thought maybe it might help the public to see the product in the environment? 
know how you would... So I've got some landscape beds, which have, I'm supposed to have been completing the plastering on for about seven years, but I'm just too busy <laughs> growing things in the beds to finish the plastering. But what um, somebody who was a good plasterer, not Chris this time, but they, we just, as long as you've got the, the plaster up off the ground, um, so that it's not going to get kind of moisture, the, the, the dirt right there. So I've just got mine on pavers and then it's a clay plaster and it's got, so I'm going to take my hat off, and it's got lime plaster over the top. Um, and the one that I have completed has lasted pretty well, you know. Um, so that could definitely work as an option. I mean, this here, if it had lime plaster, if it had been done properly and then had lime plaster on, would have lasted, you know, reasonably well. You just got to check it. in you know Bendigo and stuff like that and, and certainly mud play, um, mortars uh, between you know, between the schist um, buildings there so central Otago does have a whole load of hundred year old adobe buildings that you unprotected don't now, yeah. fully unprotected no roof yeah. that you don't you don't see uh, you don't really notice essentially yeah. but they're either outside of Alex um, yeah you know there's lots lots of them um, for retaining I don't like to use it um, just because it's, it's it's got the potential to get wet that's the, the bottom line and um, it's structural and it's yeah. structural and, and if it goes it, it goes so yeah I, I tend not to use I'd stay I'd, I'd stabilize them with lime and you can you can just about make it work but not for anything serious should we say uh, with my structural engineer how yeah. I, I, yeah I just yeah Use stone, you know. I mean, the, use the use the right material for the job. Um, sort but of certainly, thing. garden walls and things. And as Andrew was saying, you know, with that footing at the bottom and with that capping at the top, super versatile. It's just it's just stopping, you know, water sitting on top of it and eating through. But yeah. some of those walls, Andrew's uh, that Paul's describing, you know, they're really beautiful kind of sculptures in the landscape that just, yeah. you know. So if you're happy for your garden wall to kind of look like that in a hundred years, great. You know, that's it's kind of a beautiful thing. So. Yeah. Um, can I questions? get a selfie with everyone before we finish? Because <laughs> <laughs> I always do. Right, smile everyone. <laughs> awesome, thank you. <laughs> Anyone else? With, oh, sorry, with any the, other? With the timber framing, say for the straw bale, like with the coats, can you use untreated timber? Yes, well you've been using metal Yeah, paper. I think I don't like to use untreated radiator pine because it's a bit rubbish basically um, from a um, yeah from a durability uh, point of view um, and, and a risk you know point of view really but yeah untreated macrocarpal or something like that not not a problem and again on the inside face I think of the of a wall you're much less likely to encounter moisture than you are on the outside face and the top plate rather than the bottom plate so we've definitely had constructive discussions about we can use you know an untreated timber here but this has got to be treated um, yeah. sort of thing and yeah. yeah so yes and there's a also a possibility answer. I mean we've only talked about the kind of more conventional buck and beam method but you can use post and beam yeah, so you might ones. have a big solid hardwood post and hardwood beams that are doing your structure and then your straw sort of infilled or either side of those yeah. you know so it doesn't have to be stick frame you know it could be a, yeah, like a timber frame no no you can do it this is honestly my yeah. feeling like it's got to work but sort of if, 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 if you can if, if it's going to work then you can you can look at it and prove it's going to work and then you need a it. mad engineer you that's prepared a, to sign yeah, off and then you're okay much, but, <laughs> but i'm not gonna i'm not gonna sign off something that's stupid you know that's the that's the i mean i think all councils can be difficult yeah. but with any type of bill but i mean it's yeah. again it's about it's about having the right team of people and sort of yeah. demonstrating what you're doing. Do right um, and you know, and so one thing like that eBands is kind of working towards potentially, because we've got people all over the country, um, is actually offering that we become sort of yeah. experts that can help council. So when they get consents, they can sort of come to us and we can help them sort of look at them because we've got knowledge that, you know, they don't have and it makes it a bit less scary for them. Yeah. Um, so that's something that we, we want to do more and build relationships with councils because we recognise that's an issue and it puts people off. Yeah. You know? Oh, yeah. Oh, interesting. 
Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's one of the yeah. last year. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Yeah. But again, is that a, they've had one problem with one thing. Yeah. Let's, yeah. You know, and therefore are risk on a, a risk averse. Yeah. yeah. Which, you know, which they sort of should be as a backstop you know to, to ensure that you don't get people just going oh saw someone build this and you know but at the same time identify the problem solve it and sort it out rather really. than blanket rather than, yeah, exactly yeah you know, so yeah yeah cool yeah. yeah so i mean if anyone wants to feel any materials go <laughs> play, for your play life with stuff. play with some clay yeah. um but yeah we'll do yeah you guys should yeah definitely and where do you guys go to school glenorchy no. oh, we'll have to come and do one at yeah. your school won't we it's in school. oh is it yeah 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 <laughs> Well, we can definitely, yeah, here you go. Um, yeah, come and talk to us, but then maybe also lunch, is that right? Build something with these. <laughs> yeah, you can slop that around, mate, if you like.